wasn't paying attention to the chat either. Uh, well, I think that Martin and John definitely have thoughts uh, that they can just <laughs> lay out because there's a lot of uh, in the, okay, the, I'm just seeing, the I'm chat just seeing section. Noel saying, pick me, pick me. So, oh, okay. Stephen, you go uh, first. Then. I, I want Martin and then, and and then Martin word, but... and then John. <laughs> <laughs> what an exciting lecture, boy. That, that, uh, if you can forgive the pun, I found it to be electrifying, you know, like uh -huh. all that sort of stuff. Um, so, <laughs> so many questions I'd like to ask. Um, in terms of the concept of electromagnetic signaling of cells, uh, possibly tying into disease as well as a health mm. and, and development, Matt, are you familiar with the reputed uh, work of uh, Henri Priore in France in the 50s? Nope, I'm not. So, uh, you know, if we allow ourselves to go down the uh, path of thought that not only is there suppression of, of actual fact in political affairs and historical affairs, mm -hmm. but we also see potential mechanisms or agencies that work in the scientific domain. Uh, and then we take the medical area or, or sub-discipline. Um, it's a gentleman in, I believe it was France, who was sort of working with electromagnetic energy, treating disease on the sort of the, and, and this is just my layman's understanding of it as the story goes, and I can direct you to some online resources afterwards. Um, but apparently the theory goes that healthy cells have certain electromagnetic signatures. And, you know, analogous to, you know, the, the astronomer's view of certain elements and stars and so on and so forth. Mm. And uh, he developed a supposedly an electromagnetic technology where, where some sort of resonance or feedback, if you have unhealthy cells, so let's say cancer cells, they would admit different minute electromagnetic fields. But if you can couple the device with the cells um, and achieve a harmonic resonance, you can change their frequencies. In fact, you reverse the cancerous process in cells. So according to the story, uh, the sources I've read, he actually developed a machine that could in effect cure cancer via this technology and supposedly it was suppressed by whatever forces that exist. Mm. Um, so I just thought I'd throw that out to you. If you'd heard of it or not, I'm not saying it's true. I just want to make you aware of it, that mm. there is that sort of story and there is some evidence I can direct, direct you to some resources if you're interested, but um, there's so much, I mean, I'd want to say, is there an analogy to Bode's law with quasars? Um, there's a Dr. Paul Leviolette who's done uh, some stunning research on the locations of pulsars within our own galaxies. And there's just a wealth of stuff. What a brilliant lecture. Thank you so much. And, but I'll throw you with that Henri Priore thing if you um, want to throw some thoughts on it or, or express an interest or something. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely interested in that. I, I don't, uh, I didn't know about him until now, and I'll definitely be happy to look into that. Um, I know what you said about uh, um, regulating or, or bringing cancerous, unhealthy, uh, disharmonic cell um, cell growth into harmony. Uh, I, I have seen that there was an Italian scientist in the 70s and 80s who did remarkable work on. Uh, this is not cancerous, uh, but this is on gangrene. And there were, there were limbs that were going to be amputated from patients who had advanced gangrene and using, in his case, he was using uh, magnetic fields uh, with specific oscillations programmed into them. And he, he turned the, he used pulsating magnetic fields that had a very beneficial effect and saved the limbs of many, many patients. Um, so it definitely had a, a, a very positive effect upon the cell growth and cell behavior which I'm sure folds into that. I haven't seen it until you just mentioned that now. I haven't seen anything. I've seen claims and some of it that I've looked at has a bit of like a snake oil salesman quality to it uh, of people claiming that they could, you know, fix all your cancers with uh, electromagnetism. Um, yeah, I know my video just died. I don't know why. Um, but, uh, but I'm open to anybody with rigor. Yeah. Who's done this well, because uh, obviously that's the problem is that there's poop in the punch bowl. Right. And you, you always have people, as soon as that there, there, there's, there's an insight into something that has value, you have a bunch of, of uh, dilettantes who jump on board wanting to make money or just wanting to have fame, and they just screw up the entire field of, of inquiry by their lack of rigor, and it's annoying. Yeah, the, uh, just very quickly, I'll, I'll give you the link, but the, uh, the information source that I'm using is a uh, PhD physicist, Lieutenant Tom 
Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tom Bearden retired U.S. Army, so I'm, I'm oh. thinking he's legit enough that if he's giving this story, there must be some basis in fact to it. Yeah, also, absolutely. Send it, send it out. Yeah. If it's good, we'll, uh, we'll share it in the, uh, the group. And thank you for a great lecture. Hey, <laughs> thanks for being here. Cool. Uh, any, uh, anybody else have a thought uh, or, or a question? Uh, Marty, I, I saw your hand, and John probably. Uh, Marty, go for it. Uh, but Marty, you're on. You're on mute. Every, everybody's on mute. Everyone. I'd suggest it would be very interesting to find out what we do not know and really cannot know, which is what kind of unique medical technology may be available in very restricted ways for some of these people. Uh, I leave that point at that. The one other much more general point I'd like to make back on your whole wonderful presentation, Matt. It was masterful. It was. It was Thank you so much. We, we are all so deep. I mean, it, it, it's, for me, it's Irish exaggeration, but Stephen, I think, is less prone to it. So he, he gives credibility to what I'm saying. Uh, and I think we all feel that way about what you've done. Uh, the point I'd just like to make here, and again, it's a historical context one. As John pointed out to me, Hannes, Alfin, and Birkeland, their work goes back to the 1930s and earlier. Birkeland is working on this stuff, I think, even right after, possibly during, certainly right after World War One. Now, it's a very environmental... 1990s. Well, I, I, I take it. Thank you. I, I very much stand corrected. Exactly. Now, where did Birkeland and Hannah Schalfen come from? They're Scandinavians. They, uh, just as you, uh, you and Stephen are, and Cynthia are Canadians. You live in the North. You are in societies which where people take for granted electronic effects in the atmosphere. You see the northern lights. There is more of an awareness in society. The older I get, the more I'm convinced, especially in modern America, that people don't live in a wider world. They live in a much narrower world than we did 100, 150 years ago, often by choice, usually by choice, because people live increasingly urbanized in tiny little bubbles. And outside those bubbles, People are outside their comfort, comfort zones and do not want to know about uh, anomalous scientific and environmental data that upsets their cozy limits of their system. Our models of science come from England in the 18th and 19th centuries. An empire that wanted to stay an empire forever, an empire that was totally averse and horrified by the idea of physical in, in upheaval in the environment and it's in the history and memory. So you have Charles Lyell and uniformitarianism in geology. And from him, you get Darwin and the assumption of long, slow, gradual, peaceful evolution that never take, and we now know that doesn't happen. We now know as John and others have been saying, there are huge leaps in the fossil record there are times when, uh, as you said, Matt, there is an abundance of life in the earth and then suddenly everything disappears and then there's another blossoming of life in the earth. And as John points out, cosmic catastrophe uh, is a mechanism for this. Emmanuel Velikovsky coined the term uh, uh, cat catastrophic evolution as opposed to evolution by Nat natural, uh, natural selection. What natural selection is, apart from being a fairy tale, is, as you pointed out repeatedly, Matt, and rightly so, it's a wonderful self-biological fantasy that justifies the eternal oppression of the poor by the rich and the rest of the world by the British. That's what uh, evolution comes down to. When you look at the work of Stephen Elliott Gould, you find somebody who's in that pattern, recognizes there are anomalies, and tries basically with legalistic word games to split the difference so that you can still keep the comforting to him uh, fantasies of evolution, of gradual evolution, without admitting there are gigantic upheavals even within the human record, though they were documented by, repeatedly by cultures and civilizations and peoples who didn't have written records, but had oral ones, at the time. Yeah. So I've gone on as usual far too much already, but again, thank you. Uh, what you said is massive. Oh well, yeah, what, if I may, one key point is this. Birkeland and Alphen are not allowed to be in the general uh, 
accepted scientific mainstream. They're frozen out of it most of their lives. Alfin is a, is, a, is a real problem because being a Scandinavian, his work impressed the Nobel Prize Committee so overwhelmingly that they, gave, they resisted the usual pressure from the Royal Society in London and from the US uh, powers that be and gave him the Nobel Prize for physics, which he so richly deserved anyway. And therefore he cannot be totally banished, but he's still not taught, he's still not acknowledged, but he's there. And the biggest thing Alfin gives us is something that Einstein himself, as I've said before, is totally ignorant of, that space is not a vacuum, that there is an ether. There is an ether. It is ionized gas plasma, and it fills not just our solar system or our galaxy, but as far as we can tell, the entire universe. And the one po further point, and then I must stop, uh, I'll add, is Eric Crewe and the Electrical Research Association in Britain from 1942 onwards were recreating the shapes of galaxies in simple electric spark tests that they did in tiny, modest British laboratories. They didn't need CERN, they didn't need cyclotrons, yeah. they didn't need the Kirov Institute uh, uh, in, 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 in Russia. Uh, that you're able to do this in any of the laboratory that has basic electrical equipment and a Bunsen burner. And you can recreate the different shapes of galaxies. Now this validates ARP's brilliant insights. And there's a tradition today, it's, it's still going strong. You might want to invite him if he'll speak to us. Wild Thornhill, who founded and runs the, I, I think he may be semi-retired now, but he's still active, the, uh, the, the Electric Universe people. He's been the key person developing this well, work, especially on galaxy formation and evolution over the last generation. Yeah. Thank you. We, we might actually have somebody, um, I won't say his name just yet, who's very uh, high up in the electric universe uh, world uh, speak um, in a, in a, during, at some point in this lecture cycle. <clears throat> um, and I should be able to let people know by uh, next week. Um, yeah, I know you've, you've, you've touched on a lot of topics. Um, there, there's one thing, um, there's two, I guess, two thoughts that, that entered my mind just listening to you, you speak. And that's why I, I find it really nice just to listen to you sometimes uh, just develop your, your thoughts because it, it invokes a lot of ideas in my mind that would never have gotten stimulated. So I, I always appreciate listening to you. Um, and I'm looking forward to your class. By the way, Martin, I, I saw in the chats who's given the class on, Elf, on Hans Elfin. Uh, that will be Martin in two weeks, I believe, um, who will be doing that. Uh, so very much looking forward to that. Uh, the two thoughts that I had, um, I've got a book uh, written by a Canadian in the uh, early, late, late 80s. No, it was actually written in 1973 uh, called The Chaining of Prometheus. It's a really interesting book. And this guy was a cutting edge physicist, a, a biologist, and he was working on embryology and Gurbach radiations in the 1920s and 30s. I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, and he was a civil servant. He worked in uh, science policy in Canada. And, uh, and he writes, having gone through uh, this attack on science policy in Canada by uh, the Club of Rome, the systems analysis crowd that he, he calls, he starts his book, um, which is a, an adage to, uh, you know, Aeschylus is Prometheus bound where Zeus is uh, punishing Prometheus, the demigod for having stolen fire from the, the gods to give to the mortals. And he is, uh, he's using Maurice Lamontagne, who was the, the president of the Privy Council of Canada in the 60s and who goes on to co-found the Club of Rome of Canada with uh, Maurice Strong under uh, Trudeau uh, in 1970. And he uh, calls him Zeus. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a really well-woven book from somebody on the inside who is not just a, a civil servant, but a practical scientist. And he's making the point that all of the science momentum, everyone if, in the scientific community believe that the next phase of scientific evolution was going to be on Gervic tradiation on, uh, he has a, a, he talks about the, the approach to, uh, to cell and, and life science, as well as plasma physics. Um, he's like, that's where everybody knew the momentum was going until this artificial thing came on and disrupted that flow with a massive reorganization of science policy distribution in, in, in the Privy Council, uh, from the Privy Council office in Canada. And he, he, always, he focuses on a Canadian aspect, but you could look at history and see the same process happening um, across Europe, across the United States, uh, that really attempted to impose a new way of thinking onto society that would put us into a smaller intellectual cage. And one of the things that he points out is the emphasis, the defunding of plasma physics in favor of mathematical 
uh, math, the mathematical variety of, of physics without practical application. So you, you had a lot of effort to just replace constructive geometry, uh, practical physical uh, plasma engineering, which would al allow us our minds to confront these amazing phenomenons of solitrons in, uh, in, in plasmas, right? These orbs that just self-organize and that you have these vortices and you have these little galactic structures that show up when you're dealing with plasmas and electromagnetic fields. Uh, it's, 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 it's something that the mind is forced to come to terms with, which obviously have implications on cosmological thinking too, because you see the same thing in the macro level, but on longer time scales, because things are just happening, you know, on a, on a macro scale. And it, but it's the same type of quality of transformation happening. So they defunded that. So less, fewer and fewer minds were put onto that challenge as they were redirected towards, and, you know, it wasn't just mathematics, but also, uh, you know, like sociology, the humanities, they, they, they made the point in the book that that's where we had to put all the funding for the more rep to make education relevant, we had to get rid of uh, things that were not conducive for a post-industrial society. And they were always thinking about, you know, how do you create cogs for the machine? And what was, the, and since the machine was going to be post-industrial, no longer industrial, uh, we had to have people who would be adaptable to that type of world, who would not be creative. So he was right to, to point out the, the uh, Prometheus-Zeus relationship, I think was really apt. And uh, the second thing was on the issue of quantization and uh, how, like a lot of the stuff in terms of method really gets back to Plato. Because when you read Plato's Timaeus, people will, will make fun of the, uh, the elements of the Timaeus, you know, uh, there, there's things that are not, you know, like it's 2,500 years ago, but the, the method of thinking of, of uh, is, is really, really powerful in terms of how do you contemplate the relationship of the, the subjective, the objective, the, the, the quantization of space, you know, uh, the role of the, the five platonic solids in organizing our understanding of the boundedness and unboundedness of, of space. And Plato makes the point, I think it's in his Philebus dialogue, that people often make the mistake of uh, when they're investigating something, everything provably exists in a state of either a, of a one, a many, and an infinite. All three, you could define everything that's a mad conceivable as infinite, as an infinite, as a many and as a one. So I've, there's one of me, I'm a Matthew, but you know, I've got like this many limbs you could cut off and, and put them together, right? I got this many organs, I got this many cells, so you can quantify me that way, or you could just infinitely divide me intellectually into, you know, forever. Um, so he, Plato makes the point that often people will make the mistake of recognizing that, uh, that trifold coexistence of things and leap immediately from the infinite to the one or the one they'll start with the one and then they'll just start breaking down the one into infinite mechanical parts but they'll they'll skip the important stage of the many which is where you get the quantization and inside the philebus dialogue he he puts some meat on the bones and he's like okay if you want to see an, an illustration of what i'm talking about let's look at uh he uses uh vowels in language and musical consonances he's like there's infinite possible vibrations you can get from a chord on a string but there's only very specific, you know, several moments on that chord, which we call consonant that are harmonic. Um, but it's still one string, right? Making it with, without any, it, without holding any part of the string, there's still just one string making a baseline sound. And the other example was the vowels where he's like, there's, you know, a yellow, a yellow, whatever it is, you know, like there's some infinite spectrum of sound you can make, but within that we've chosen and we put labels on certain things called AEIOU in our case in English and in the Greeks, I have no idea what it was uh, that we built a language around as quantization. So you could find it everywhere if you're looking for it, but if you skip that step, you won't see it in the redshift. You won't see it in the Schumann resonance. You won't see it in the planetary orbits around the sun. You won't see it in the, uh, why are the electrons, you know, moving in certain orbitals, you know, uh, where they are and not some other places. What's the relationship of the, the photons, if in fact there are photons, I don't even, I'm not even convinced that there are inside of the nucleus uh, as we know them, you know, um, but, but why are there these quantities and not some other quantities? What is the harmonics? Um, and people like Kepler were asking that question and Leibniz was asking that question and they were, their, their, their question bore fruit. It got discoveries to happen that were applicable to make life better for people. And those who don't ask the questions, they just get stuck in a infinitely regressive mathematical 
<laughs> hullabaloo. So anyway, that's my thought. You, yeah. But any, yeah. So anybody else um, have, a, have a thought or a question? Yeah, John. John. Okay. Yeah, hey, I must say, Matt, I'm impressed. You don't have a scientific background, and you did a remarkable job. Thank you, John. That's a, that's a big coming from you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. I, you, you, everyone knows that uh, praise from John uh, is is hard to find. Very rare creature. Rarer than a <laughs> yeah. uh, to the chagrin of my children. Um, the I, listening to you, and I, I've been I was leafing through scene red uh, as uh, as you were uh, as you were talking. The quantization issue seems to be absolutely crucial. There's something deep there. That the quanti there's some there seems I haven't worked through the details, I haven't worked through the math, but the quantization seems to be relating the quantization of the redshifts of quasars, the quantization of the spins of electrons, the quantization of the angular momentum of the uh, of uh, the planets and their orbits. Uh, I mean, the and and the numbers concur. They're not. It's not simply that there's quantization like this and there, and quantization like this there. No, no. They that they're they're actually numbers that uh, keep coming up. Uh, and so it's there seems to be some deep uh, let's call it resonance uh, in the entire universe, whereby uh, there's virtually instantaneous communication. Now, uh, Matt mentioned Wall Thornhill. Uh, you know, I actually know Wall. He, uh, I met him uh, when I was living in Australia, and I also met him at one of the electronic and then like took universe. Uh, so, if you want to try to get, maybe I can try to invite him to your uh, to your series. Um, the the uh, there has to be unity to the universe. That should be one of the basic precepts of people who call themselves scientists. That there isn't chemistry and physics and biology and their separate sciences, and they have their own laws which are mutually inconsistent. And within physics, you have uh, mutually uh, mutually uh, contradictory laws for different aspects of physics. So that, that simply doesn't work. It has to. There has to be unified or model. So the work of Alfing was absolutely, uh, when I came across the book, uh, The Big Bang Never Happened, which was my first introduction to Alving's work and Tony Parat, uh, who did the computer simulations, which produced the various kinds of galaxies, uh, which also were replicated. I didn't know about the, Marty, uh, about the work done in, back in the 1940s in Britain. Um, there has to be unity. And, and that unity is continually disrupted by the way the scientific establishment works, of course, because uh, that's not the way things work. But continually, 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 they keep coming back up with these contradictions. So you mentioned the communication that's implicit between the actual uh, DNA in the water, which is then removed and then the uh, and then replicated with PCR uh, in the in the next batch of water. Once you've produced a, thrown in enough proteins into the uh, into the water, so that there's the uh, the actual material to work with to produce the DNA. That's Rupert Sheldrake. Mm. That's morphic resonance in action, right? So once something has been created somewhere in the universe, it's easier for it to be replicated. Mm. Experiments uh, the second time uh, seem to work better than the, fir than the first time mm -hmm. because they have already been created in the universe and somehow there's some memory in the universe of this happening. Mm. And um, so anyway, uh, but I, I think uh, the point that Marty made is, is very important. It's very hard to work on this stuff rigorously. First of all, you have to educate yourself to know the alternative uh, things and uh, realize that a lot of this stuff is quack. Yeah. But the, the second is that, how do you get the data? The, the, the data itself? The data itself, right? You know, for example, uh, Kepler worked with Tycho Brahe's uh, data. Tycho Brahe's data was a uh, very high quality. He didn't have to worry about the, the data being available. He had it available. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. He was court astronomer. Uh, what's happened now is that, as Marty said, data gets destroyed uh, on a regular basis. Yeah. And it's very difficult. So that means that every generation has to start completely anew. And often they're not even aware of what previously happened. Well, what I'm, what I'm noticing is that um, that's true. That's, that's terrible that the, yeah, the data is consciously being destroyed. Absolutely terrible. Um, <clears throat> but I think even more terrible is that the minds are being corrupted of the young intentionally in the schooling system so that people are trained to run away from paradox. They're like the paradox is a gift. You know, when our minds, when our, when our logic of how we explain things, that language runs into a wall when, when it hits data and empirical evidence of things, that, 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 that discrepancy is a gift. It's really great. It means that something doesn't work in our, in our assumptions that we have to reevaluate to generate a new hypothesis. Gay now, gay now, that's exactly where science begins. Yeah, that's, what would you call it? Gay now? Gay now, exactly, in German. Oh, exactly, gay now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and instead, they're trained, and I, I, I've talked to so many of these physics students and teachers, and they're trained to just make excuses. Like, no, you, no matter what, you defend your system, and if you've got to introduce dark matter, you've got to, you've got to just fudge the data in any way or, or in, introduce a new entity that didn't exist to defend your system when an anomaly is, is introduced into your, your experiences. You do that. That's okay. And so you've got, you know, like how many models of, of, uh, of string theory and, and pre-Big Bang dimensions causing the singularity. I mean, there's, there's dozens of different models that are all equally accepted by academia as having equal validity. And I think the one that's more preferred has like 11 dimensions to it, but there's others that are all just like mathematically consistent with each other um, that are elaborate, um, impressive looking, but they're all ignoring the fundamental issue of redshift. Like why are, you know, and, and the fact that there are obviously these existent uh, connections of, of different redshift, you know, quasars and, 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 and safer galaxies connected by filamentary structures everywhere. But these people uh, are not experimentalists in any sense of the word. No, I know, but it's, it's more than method. Bir my, my, my point is just that Bir the corruption Kalan is more in the method and less in the lack of data. That, that's all. Birkeland took people in the middle of the Norwegian winter to Nordcap around the turn of the 20th century. Yeah. And they didn't have the sophisticated communications infrastructure uh, and airplanes and helicopters and so on and so forth to, and snowmobiles. Uh, you know, everything had to be transported by uh, to to measure uh, the, uh, the what do you call it the uh, the aurora yeah. to to do a, a electronic uh, sorry electric measurements on the aurora. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, the point is that they. And then did his Torella experiments in his uh, physical laboratory. But to come back to the, uh, I visit, I went to Oslo, I went to the uh, museum. Um, I forget exactly which museum it was in some suburb of, uh, and I asked, so where's this, uh, where's all this machinery of Birkeland? Um, we don't know. We'll have to check. So they found out there's, a, there's another uh, branch museum in some old, boondock place hundreds of kilometers from uh, Oslo but there wasn't in Oslo and they, none of this stuff was described yeah so even in the place where this stuff was born the history is erased yeah no absolutely and there's two things that I'm thinking about uh, to that number one is reading source material like a lot of people are, are not used to going back to reading Birkland's writings uh, or like reading, just read Christian Birkeland or read Hans uh, Elfin or, you know, read the published writings of Halton Arp or Kepler or Leibniz. Like people can do that. And it's so much more valuable to just immerse yourself um, into the original writings so that you develop new instincts of thinking because our instincts suck. You know, we're by virtue of having gone through the culture and gone through the education system, it's malformed our instincts. Um, <laughs> Uh, you can't trust them. And, and so you have to develop better habits of thinking and better habits of feeling about your thinking, which is what these guys did to be great scientists. And you get that the more you read it, the more you sort of awaken a little bit of that quality inside of you. Um, you get it when you read a lot of Plato too, uh, or anything, you know, you just, peep. so um, on the one hand, there's, there's that I think is really important to get back to that, that, that practice, which we've fallen out of heavily. Now, nowadays we go to Wikipedia to see what somebody, we don't even know their name, 
has as an opinion of, as an authority about a great thinker. We don't just go to the great thinker. What, like, why not just skip the middleman? Um, the other thing was we have a, a friend, uh, you know, well, you know, Quautemoc, um, and he's doing really great work on small modular uh, molten salt thorium reactors in uh, Ontario. And there's a lot of great application. Like, he's working with teams in Sweden. Um, the, the problem with a lot of the, the designs, because he's coming up with computer models to deal with different designs for containing the, the molten salt and different ways of, of maximizing the efficiency. And it's all really good. But um, he was at a, a recent uh, nuclear conference with teams around the world who were all working in a similar, similar domain on, on, on these reactors. And we were asking him about it. And he, he said, the problem is that he doesn't have anything physical to work with. It's all computer modeling. The government and, and even the private sector isn't supplying the resources to actually build experimental uh, machinery and and anything to even get prototypes. So it's all theoretical. And he's like, if I was in, in Argentina or in China, the Chinese teams and the Argentinian teams, they actually have massive support. They're dealing with physical uh, prototypes that they're building. They're, they're, they're much more hands-on. Um, he's like, I, 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 he was jealous. <laughs> but... Uh, but it really just got across the immediate problem. Yeah, we're, we're, we're destroying the practical way to test out our ideas. We've shut down our fusion reactors. We've retired a lot of these, these different, or the, the, not fusion reactors, but these tokamaks we used to have, we've retired them. Even Canada used to have like a, you know, in Varennes, Quebec, we had an experimental advanced world renowned uh, tokamak that we took apart and put in a museum after it won a reward in 1998 as the best reactor of the, of the kind or the best tokenmark of the kind for plasma experiments. We've it, we just dismantled it. Now these students have nothing but computer models to work with. And they did this all over the US, all over Europe. It's and only China, China's doing it differently. They, they actually are, are taking up the torch. Not, not always, but they're, they're doing it much better than we are. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, with respect to plasma, you, yeah, when you look at the Russian avant-garde, Mach 27, you have this pl plasma flying and you have this physical device flying within the plasma without this physical device getting burnt up. Mm. You can assume that they have very classified uh, developments that are uh, yeah. playing around many of these topics. Yeah, yeah. But that's not available to us. Right? The, uh, that's simply, for obvious reasons, it's simply not available to us. We, we, we can only surmise what's, ha what's physically happening in those processes. Yeah. Well, that brings it back to geopolitics, right? Of the geopolitic, uh, geopolitical aspect of science. Because yeah, to the degree that we deny the, the open system win-win non-zero sum uh, design of Russia, China, and other nations of the multipolar alliance, if we deny that and we continue to impose our aggressive zero sum mentality, yeah, they have to keep things withheld. They just have to. It's, it's not a choice for them. They don't, they don't necessarily want to have a world of secrecy and Byzantine you know, <laughs> backstabbing. They don't want to do that, but we're forcing them to if they're going to survive. So, yeah. Meh. So. All right, guys. So, oh, Scott, do you have a, a second? Yeah. Uh, Schauberger comes to mind. Yeah, um, Victor Schauberger. Yeah. Absolutely. Support on Schauberger. And um, um, so the science of... Uh, vortices yeah you know what he he discovered one um you did a great you did a presentation on him i think some time ago i don't know if you mm -hmm. put it up or no i i want to i never did oh you never did okay I, he came up in my ufo mk ultra paper um as, oh. a, as a side note it wasn't even anything i developed but yeah he, he looks fascinating yeah well he uh i think he had the right insight into um you know watching what water does and, and, and extrapolating for, you know, um, how, you know, so how water moves and uh, moves, moves and it's, and it's, um, you know, laws of movement and vortices and this, this, this whole thing. And that I, you know, and I, he already knew he was thinking about like plasma. I think he was already thinking about, you know, these, uh, applying it to gases and, 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 and plasma and plasma. And I think this, the two, um, just, you know, they resonate with, with each other to understand these plasmoids. Um, and I was just listening to Claridge's last, you know, he did his uh, part one and part two with the um, yeah, introduction, introduction of the cosmology of the, of the electric universe. 
Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, some mind bending um, ideas of, of, you know, and we also have, to, and then another thought was, you know, how, how the energy traverses through an ether, I mean, would still apply, um, you know, Leibniz least action principle. Um, and so it, it just, it's taking it to another level yeah. of, um, you know, of application from the physical world. But uh, Schauberger's work seems to me like I just, you know, um, we're looking at the shadows of more fundamental energies and how they move and like the Birkeland currents themselves and understanding these principles, like, you know, a, a twisting current, you know, that's one's clockwise, counterclockwise. I mean, and then um, uh, Thunderbolts have done a great job of, you know, displaying yeah. too. I mean, the, the mixture of um, the geometric patterns, like the, the, the uh, hexagon on the North pole of Saturn. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You know, all these things. So, I mean, they're all connected and there is a unity. Yeah. Uh, but what, what I'd really like to see, and I, I know John has uh, has done a bit of work on this at some point, maybe not in this course cycle, but um, I know the the question of the uh, the, the Gauss Ampere um, approach sure. to electrodynamics, even, I mean, decades before Max Planck uh, came onto the scene and made his breakthroughs in black body radiation, you had Weber, Wilhelm Weber, working with the, the Gauss Ampere networks, who was able to calculate, I think it was something like the, the distance of the, the inner electron to the nucleus or something. Uh, I mean, using... He, pre he, predicted, he predicted the existence of the nucleus 40 years before it was discovered. Like, dear God, right? And he calculated it. It wasn't just like a thought. It was he actually made calculations on the distances of some of these uh, electrons to the, the nucleus. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that something like that also should be taken up. Because um, Arguably, theoretical physics stopped with the death of Weber. Well, at least it was, it was definitely uh, beaten down quite a bit. It, 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 it stopped running and it started crawling. Um, so, yeah. I meant productive theoretical physics. Yeah, right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's the theme that, that comes out is, um, you know, I mean... Um, you know, when you look at the uh, turn of the century, um, you know, um, and so Birkeland working in the 1880s, 90s, 1890s, and, and Tesla first electrifying, you know, Washington, D.C., 1899, discovery of X-rays by the uh, curés, um, you know, around that time, you, you're looking at an explosive, explosive growth of technological scientific information. Mm -hmm. And you can see that the British empire, just, they know what their mission is. They have to stop that period. And that's why they, it, they go after and, you know, and with the Solvay conferences in 1926 yeah, and start ousting and, and creating this, uh, um, um, you know, set partitioning of scientists so they can't collaborate. And then, you know, ultimately we get to the point where they're, taking down tokamak reactors you know i mean ridiculous it's like this right yeah. so um can you imagine where we'd be um you know had that not really happened maybe the the thing um fdr understood best was you know i mean um you know what the uh, manhattan project was to just um uh you know science driver like no other we've seen in 20th century um it's too bad that he died prematurely to direct that energy in a positive way uh, instead of being taken over by the British establishment. Mm -hmm. um, and like our mentor trainer, you know, Paul said that if Kennedy, Jack Kennedy had lived and served two terms and if his brother had lived and served two terms, we'd have already had fusion power by now. We'd be on a different trajectory. And um, yeah. No, you know, I think so that, it's important. You know, it's, it's always important to take the, uh, <clears throat> to not speak about science in an apolitical framework, but to have a sense that there is, there is an oligarchy and you can't look at the evolution of our, of our science and its practical applications in terms of the emancipation of mankind from the material forces on the earth over time uh, without understanding that there is this oppressive uh, intention, which is, a, it's continuous going back many generations into the, into deep history it's a continuous intention, which at various times has more or less influence over the system it, it yearns to control by its nature. Um, 
and it has certain modus operandi. It's got certain intelligible qualities that are constant, even though times today are different from the days of the Roman Empire uh, long past, right? It's a very different world that we live in, but there's certain constants regarding the Zeus Prometheus quality. And I, I, I mean, I personally, I really am grateful for having read through for many years a lot of the, the works of, uh, of Lyndon LaRouche, who was the first I'd encountered who sort of put a, a unity to a lot of this universal history that gave me sort of a structure to begin to uh, explore and piece things together um, in terms of the, this oligarchical impulse versus this more humanist, you know, platonic uh, impulse, which sees humanity, God, the universe in two totally different paradigms, even though the words that they use are the, are the, the same words. Uh, the, the meaning, the context of what defines the words um, is totally different, two different realities. So from there, you're able to see, okay, well, why is, uh, why are a lot of the, the scientists who we are told we have to like worship as if they were gods like Darwin or Newton, you can't say anything bad about these godheads. Well, when you actually start probing a little bit behind the scenes of things, you start seeing that, no, these are, these are actually not really, these are counterfeits. And there's, there's, a huge battle within science between two schools of thought and people like Leibniz, like Kepler, like Huygens, like Therma were the ones actually provably making these breakthroughs, but we're not told about them so much. We're maybe given their names, but we're not told about what they did. And, and the, the discoveries that they made are largely just stolen and, and repackaged and attributed to a certain cardboard cutout who's turned into an untouchable, like a Newton, right? Or a, or Darwin. I, I don't know if Darwin actually made discoveries per se, but anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's it's really useful to to do that. And but you're told you're not you're you're not going to be respected. You're you're you should be you know you, people are are ashamed and they censor themselves from thinking in those in those terms because there's just this group pressure in polite society. You just can't do that. Um, so it, it really it stifles the creative imagination a lot. But yeah, and, and also, yeah, again, just the reading through original writings it, as, as your, your driver for forming a, a, a university curriculum in a healthy society, people should be constantly just going back to a, original thinkers and internalizing their way of thinking more than the individual predicates of what they're saying, but just look at the way that they're thinking because you'll find that there's the same actions of the mind and core concepts that are being developed across the board that are tied to a moral identity for the most part, not always, and almost to the same degree, but for the most part, you'll find it there. It's, it's, it hits you in the face. And definitely Halt and Arp exemplified it really well. The other thing that's interesting yeah. too, hmm? um, uh, with the, um, just to make a note, I mean, uh, China developing its um, medical system or the practice of you know, acupuncture based on the hypothesis of, of energy um, that that's processed and used by the cells, you know, mm. the interaction of energy by the cells, um, you know, maybe, maybe we need to relook at that and maybe we need to study that a little bit more. And, um, you know, uh, um, because what is a, what is a, um, a new paradigm, uh, you know, uh, medicine, you know, in terms of, and I think it would incorporate a new understanding of electromagnetism and, 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 incorporated and this uh the life you know the phases of uh the life phase uh so to speak right by vanatsky mm -hmm. um you know there was a guy too um just to point out um who's often overlooked an interesting characters a guy named royal rife um who was the first guy to create i think the strongest microscope that could um watch living organisms uh, and a, and something about a black uh, a back uh, backlit and back or uh, black lit something uh, field, and so with that technology they could have gain insight into um, a lot of the uh, you know uh, living processes, and um, he came up with a machine that um, he claimed he studied resonances, and uh, he came up with uh, uh, a machine apparently that could treat cancer. Yeah. and destroy 
cancer that, or that the, might be or true. I, I, I've, I've read a lot about him. I, I it's hard to investigate. Ah. Um, cause he, oh, okay. there, there's, he may be legit and he may not be. I know, I know he definitely had a crackdown that was very unjust against him and his machines yeah. were confiscated. There's so little data though. I, I don't, I'm still on the fence of whether or not he was snake oil or whether he was legit. I don't, I don't know. Um, it's, it's, it's tough. A lot, as, yeah, as are a lot of these things. I, you know, yeah. And yeah. I, I don't know if he actually had success in his treatments. It, it didn't, from what I've seen, didn't seem like they, they were successful. Although claims were made anecdotally, I can't find evidence that they were. I, I don't know. But point is, yeah, there's a whole, there's a lot of people. We can't, we can't dismiss him and we can't celebrate him. And I find that there's a, a tendency to do both. Uh, from people I, I've encountered who either like hear something I've written about uh, on Max Planck or something, and they immediately treat him as, as though he, he is absolutely irrefutably the, the wonder that, that he is, or that we're told he is, or they just dismiss him as being a quack and a, and a phony. And uh, there's just not a lot of measure to really explore. Okay, well, let's just pause and see the data. Let's, let's look for, and it's tough. Like Marty said, when, when there's so much work to, that's gone into destroying a lot of the data as well, it, it does hold things back a bit. You have to really just reconstruct the experiments, right? That, that's sort of what has to be done to, to go somewhere. Well, the, the only thing that correlates with that that I've heard is there was a TED talk um, by a doctor, I think, uh, talking about residents. Um, and he, I think I mentioned it to you in an um, 11th interval, which is an octave is eight, and 11th is another minor second above that, um, where they found, he says he found, uh, and then the frequencies and whatnot um, mm -hmm. that destroyed, uh, they could target cells. So I found that interesting. And I think that's kind of, that might be what Royal Rife had discovered. Well, that's interesting. Possibly. Very right? interesting. Yeah. It's on TED Talks. It's, it's, well, it's email, it. email it to me or text yeah. it to me. I'd, I'd like to see that. Okay. All right, guys. So we got a long week ahead of us. And uh, thank you so much for, for sticking it out. And uh, a lot more presentations coming online soon. For those who want, uh, this Sunday, we're going into part four of the reading of uh, In Defense of Common Sense. I think we're on chapter 10 or so. If you want to join in, you don't have to necessarily have read one through nine, but it helps. Uh, so that's at 8 p.m. Wednesday. And otherwise, we'll meet back Sunday, same time next week. Mm -hmm.